you all stand. We sure welcome you out to the wedding this afternoon. We're just going to sing a few, few congregational songs. Amen. Go ahead and put those up on the screen if you would. There is a source in times of need that gives me hope, that brings me peace in every trial.
shall take my heavenly flight. Oh, beautiful land, I long for song here we're going to sing. In the heart this field now ripened there's a word for all to do. Hark the voice of God is calling to the heart this calling you. Little is much when God call to labor seem too small and little known. It is great if God is in it and he'll not forget his own. Little If we are faithful, welcome home, my child will know. For little is much when God is hidden. They are not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it. If you go in Jesus' name. And when we end. To heaven's portals and our Savior's face we see. Cares of life will be forgotten. We'll be happy, glad, and free. Little seated. The wealthiest rancher in Texas was throwing a grand jubilee. To honor his son, who just turned 21 and was visiting down from the east. It was rumored he wanted to marry, so every girl in the county was there. But soon he grew tired of their fashion and their pride. He stepped outside for some air. It was there on the back step that he saw her And the moonlight shone down on her face She was washing the floor and stealing his poor 
heart away He knew he would love her forever As they walked beneath the dark Texas sky He knelt as he asked her to marry Then he watched as the tears sprang from her eyes He feared she was going to refuse him So he bid her, please don't make a sound I am leaving tonight for Chicago I must ride before the snow lies on the ground But I'm going there to build for you a mansion And returning I'll make you my wife Meet me here by the stables one year from tonight Don't you hear the Eliezer call? 
falling There's going to be a wedding And, and our joy will soon begin In the evening when the camel train comes in Now the blessed Holy Spirit From our Father God above Has come down to earth To find a worthy bride And our Isaac over yonder Has prepared the tents of love And he wants his fair Rebecca By his Now we've left our kinfolk gladly And we bade this world goodbye We are going to a home beyond the sky Where we'll soon behold our Isaac In that blessed eternity What a happy, happy wedding that will be all oh, things ready now the evening shadows fell did you hear the Eliezer calling we have come into this wedding and our joy is now in him and the bridegroom bids his lovely bride come in. And the bridegroom bids his lovely bride come
Dearly beloved, we are gathered together in the presence of God to join together this man and woman in holy matrimony. It is an honorable estate instituted of God, signifying unto us the mystical union that is between Christ and his church. It is commended in the scripture to be honorable among all, and therefore is not by any to be entered into unadvisedly or lightly, but reverently, discreetly, advisedly, soberly, and in the fear of God. And to this holy estate, these two persons come now to be joined. We have gathered as family and friends of this man and this woman to lend our support and goodwill to this union. Who will give this woman to be married to this man? I, her father, and her mother. You can be seated. Daniel Arendt, will you take Caitlin Williams to be your wedded wife, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Will you love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health? Forsaking all others, keep yourself only unto her, so long as you both shall live? I will. Caitlin Williams, will you take Daniel Arendt to be your wedded husband, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Will you love him, comfort him, honor and obey him in sickness and in health? Forsaking all others, keep yourself only unto him so long as you both shall live? I will. Amen. Let's all bow our heads and pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this privilege to be here today. God, each one of us that are here, we count it, Lord, to be a privilege to see what you have done in the lives of our brother Daniel and sister Caitlin and how you've brought them to this time. God, surely you foresaw this time before the foundation of the world and knew that they would be joined as husband and wife. I pray, God, everything we do would be pleasing to you. And God, that you would bless this ceremony, you would bless all our efforts in this uniting. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we look at marriage, we see it's a major theme in the Bible, and every time we come to a wedding, it's such a wonderful opportunity to review once again the things that God has laid in the scriptures for us concerning marriage, for it is the great mystery contained throughout the entire scripture. We find it first in Genesis when God in the beginning forms the world and creates his Eden, and he makes a son and places a son to rule over Eden, but then God himself decrees that it is not good that man shall dwell alone. I will make a helpmeet for him. So it was God who, who presented the first wife to his son. So out from Adam, he pulls a rib and he takes the feminine spirit and he forms the woman and unites the two together. And what we see in the scriptures is the first marriage. And the first marriage was performed by God. It was instituted by God and it becomes the first of all human institutions. So God designed marriage. It was God's idea and God's concept. Therefore, marriage is not man's idea, but God's. Therefore, man cannot manipulate it to his purpose. Man cannot change it to, to suit his needs or his desire. Amen. To understand marriage, you have to go to the original, and it was designed and instituted by God himself. Amen. And, and God was foreshadowing in this something that he would do throughout all of Scripture. Then we, we see that later on as we go through Scripture, he chooses Abraham. Of all the people on the earth, he comes and chooses Abraham and makes a promise to him and to his seed after him that he would, he would be their God and they would be his people. And we know that he redeems them out of Egypt and he brings them to himself. And in the book of Jeremiah, he says that I have become a husband to Israel. I am married to Israel. And God wanted a people to be united with him. And we know that this people failed to keep their covenant. The covenant that they accepted at Mount Sinai, they failed and they broke. But that didn't stop God's purpose. For later we find in the New Testament that he once again is choosing a bride, amen, of his choice. Through the New Testament, now he's selecting a Gentile bride, amen. And we find that uh, all the way at the end in the book of Revelation, 
We find the term bride appearing again, for the bride hath made herself ready. We find that there's a wife at the end, and that wife is the Lamb's bride. And we know that the marriage of the Lamb has come. So we find that marriage is a theme from beginning to end in the scriptures. It's important to God, and therein lies a great mystery. So today we're going to have a a tradition that Uh, Sister Caitlin and Brother Daniel have requested they would like to perform. It's an old tradition in which at some portion in the ceremony, Caitlin, Sister Caitlin will take a portion of her veil and she will drape it over the shoulder of our Brother Daniel. And in doing so, she will signify that she is giving herself to this man, that all she is, she's entrusting to him. And she's signifying that by the placing of the veil over his shoulder. As Daniel lends his shoulder for this veil and accepts the veil, he's accepting responsibility for this woman to care for her and to keep her for the rest of her life. So it's a wonderful tradition. And and in preparation for that, I'd like to begin to look at that through the scriptures by starting by looking at the shoulder. What is the significance of the shoulder? And I'd like to begin in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment, with justice, from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So we find out that Christ is coming as the son of David to sit upon the throne of David, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. That means the entire kingdom, the responsibility and care of the whole kingdom rest upon his shoulder, because the shoulder and the back is the strongest part of a man. And that shoulder and back signifies the strength of a man, that upon the strength of Jesus Christ, this kingdom will rest. Not upon the strength of the subjects, but upon the strength of the king, amen? And so we see a beautiful type of this in Luke chapter 15. Jesus is speaking in Luke chapter 15, verse 4. It says, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And then we find that there's a lost sheep, just like we were one of God's lost sheep before he found us. And that sheep had no ability to save itself. It had no strength to find its way home. Amen. It wasn't depending on its own strength for salvation, but it was the strength of the shepherd that was declared. And the shepherd sought out the, the, the little lost sheep. And the shepherd found the sheep. And when he found them, he took the sheep and placed the sheep upon the strongest part of the shoulder, uh, the, the shepherd across his shoulders, showing that that sheep was not saved by its own strength by its own will, by its own wisdom, but that sheep was saved by the strength of the shepherd. And we have been saved by the strength of the shepherd, not our own strength, not our own ability. We could not find ourselves. We could not find the shepherd. We were lost, but the shepherd found us and laid us upon his shoulders, for the government shall be upon his shoulders. And another element of this I want to look at is in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. It says, unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. We know that Christ is the son of David, will sit upon the throne of David, but also he seemed depicted here as having the key of David. And this scripture in Revelation is referring back to a scripture in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 22, verse 22. It says, in the key of the house of David, will I lay upon his shoulder. So this key will be upon his shoulder. So he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. The prophet of God in the church age book says this, but what does this key signify? He's tying all these scriptures together now. What does this key signify? The answer lies in the position of the key. It is not in his hand, it is not worn around his neck, it is not placed in the hands of other men, or the verse could not be saying that he alone has the use of that key. For he alone opens and shuts, and no man has that right but Jesus himself. Isn't that right? But where is the key? It is on his shoulder. But what does the shoulder have to do with it? And then we verse that Isaiah 9, 6, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. But what does this mean? The answer is in the phrase, government upon his shoulder comes from the wedding ceremony of the East, 
When the bride has been committed to the groom, she takes off her veil and places it over the groom's shoulders, signifying that not only is she under his dominion, that she has transferred her rights to him. That is that he is the head, but also that he bears the responsibility and the care, and that he and he alone, no one else, no other man, no other power has any right and responsibility. And that, beloved, is the key of David. God sovereign, God being sovereign, he foreknew by divine decree exactly who would be in his bride. He chose her, she did not choose him. He called her, she did not come on her own. He died for her, he washed her in his own blood. He paid the price for her. She belongs to him and to him alone. She is wholly committed to him and he accepts the obligation. He is her head, for Christ is the head of his church. As Sarah called Abraham Lord, even so the bride is happy that he is her Lord. He speaks and she obeys, for that is her delight. Amen. He chose her. Amen. We see this in John 15 when Jesus says in John 15, verse 16, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. The disciples weren't looking for Christ. Christ was looking for them. They didn't choose him. He chose them, and they responded to that call. Amen. And so in, in, in the great story that we see through the scriptures that God, he was foreshadowing all the way back in Genesis what he wanted to do. Amen. He was going to have a son, and that son was going to have a bride. But we know that in the fall of man, in order for him to take a bride, he would have to pay a price of redemption so that he could unite because she was now in a fallen state, for all of mankind was fallen. So Christ came to bear our sins on his shoulders, and he bore those sins all the way to Calvary, so he could pay the price for us. He was taking responsibility for our sin. He was taking responsibility for our, fails, our failures, our mistakes, our life, and he was bearing that responsibility so that he could purge us and free us from that, so he could unite with us in a union, and he could, we could be one flesh, amen, with Christ. We see this in Isaiah 53, verse 4. It says, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Then in verse 11, it says, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sins of many and made intercession for the transgression. Jesus yielded his shoulders for us. Amen. He invites us now to lay our life upon his shoulder. So what you'll demonstrate shortly here is a demonstration of the great union between Christ and his bride and the great opportunity that a people have to lay their life at Christ's feet and to take their veil, amen, and lay it over his shoulder. And he has already lended his shoulder for the occasion. And he will bear our life, taking full responsibility for whatever we have been, he takes responsibility for it. What we are is what he wants because he has chosen us. And how is that choice manifest? Because all, none can come to me unless the Father draws him. And if the Father is pricking the heart and drawing, it is a declaration of Christ's choice, amen? And if we can respond to that choice, he has a shoulder there that we can lay our whole life upon. And now he will free us from our life by his shoulder, by the, what he bore on his shoulder, and he carries our sins far away, freeing us so that now he can unite to us. Whatever we were, he takes responsibility for. Whatever we are is what he has chosen. What we will be, he is obligated to care for and take care of from here on out. Amen. So now we can truly see Colossians 3.3, 3, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now you've given your life to him, you've died to your life, you've been renewed in Christ to a new life. I, I am sorry to say, but not so sorry to say, 
that during this ceremony, at some point in this ceremony, there will no longer be a Caitlin Williams. She will fade off the scene. Whatever she was will fade away because during this ceremony, she will be transformed from Caitlin Williams to Caitlin Arendt. And it's a new name and it's a new life. And then Daniel, in making his choice, he has accepted responsibility for you. Whatever you are, whatever you were, wherever you've been, he bears the responsibility. And by making his choice, he says, I'm, I'll take that on me. What you are now is what he wants, for you are his choice. Above all others, he chose you. Amen. And in doing so, he's purged you from any idea anybody else has, because now you will be the wife of a husband, and nobody else has any say in it whatsoever. It was Daniel's choice, right? And then from this day forward, whatever will happen, whatever circumstances happen in life, he, is all, he will pledge himself through this ceremony to care for all of your burdens and to carry all of your loads and to help you through everything that happens. For Christ has taken the responsibility for all of our sins. He bore it upon himself and accepted us. He chose us as we are now because we're the one he wants. And he's promised whatever will be in the future, he will take care of it. Amen. Now we can see 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. This word casting in the Greek means to throw upon, to place upon. So we can throw upon or place upon our husband, Jesus Christ, all of our care, and that care means care or anxiety. Whatever we're worried about, whatever is stressing us, whatever we cannot solve ourselves, we can place that and throw that or cast that upon Christ's shoulders. And then it says, for he careth for you. This word careth means to take care of or to care about. So from this day forward, you can take all of your anxieties and all of your worries. You no longer have to care for yourself, for there is a man that you've come under the headship of that's pledged to care for you. You can cast all of your anxiety upon him. Just like the bride of Jesus Christ has no care or no worry that she cannot cast upon Jesus Christ, and he's obligated himself to take care of it and care for us. Amen. In the demonstration that you're demonstrating in this union, you're showing us the great mystery of the Bible. You're displaying it in a man and woman coming together to be one. You'll display it in transferring your veil to Brother Daniel's shoulder. But I encourage you, display it every day of your life. Display the great union, the oneness, the harmony, the unity between Christ and his bride as Christ takes headship over for the government is upon his shoulders. Daniel, may you take headship and care and love and nurture and care for, shelter and protect, Sister Caitlin. Caitlin, reverence your husband and give him the due respect, for out of this care comes a reciprocating love, loving the one who cared for you, loving the one who bore responsibility for you, one, loving the one who chose you, and loving the one who promised to care for all of your needs. Amen. May you display every day the life of Jesus Christ and his bride. Amen. If you could turn to face one another, I'd like to go to the vows. Daniel, if you could look to Caitlin and please repeat after me. I, Daniel, take thee, Caitlin. I, Daniel, take thee, Caitlin. To be my wedded wife. To be my wedded wife. To have and to hold from this day forward. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death do us part. Till death do us part. According to God's holy ordinance. According to God's holy ordinance. I there too. I there too. Give thee my pledge. Give thee my pledge. Sister Caitlin, can you please look to Brother Daniel and repeat after me? I, Caitlin, take thee, Daniel. I, Caitlin, take thee, Daniel. To be my wedded husband. To be my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better and for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer and poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death do us part. Till death do us part. According to God's holy ordinance. According to God's holy ordinance. And there too. And there too. I give thee my pledge. I give thee my pledge. Caitlin, you can now place your veil over Daniel's shoulder.
tuck it under. Do you have a token to declare this covenant? Yes. These rings are a token of your vows to one another. The gold symbolizes divinity and declares the preciousness of this covenant ordained by God. The never-ending circle is a declaration that this marriage shall not end while both spouses remain alive. Daniel, would you please take this ring and place it on Sister Caitlin's finger and then repeat after me. With this ring, with this ring, given to thee as a token of my love, given to thee as a token of my love, I seal my vows. I seal my vows. And with all my earthly possession, and with all my earthly possession, I thee endow. I thee endow. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sister Caitlin, would you place this on Daniel's finger and repeat after me, please? With this ring, with this ring, given to thee as a token of my love, given to thee as a token of my love, I seal my vows. I seal my vow. And with all my earthly possession, with all my earthly possession, I thee endow. I thee endow. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You can join hands. We're going to invite Brother Emmanuel at this time to come and offer a, a blessing upon this union. Bow our heads and our hearts to God. Gracious Heavenly Father, we have come to this portion, Father, of the, the wedding, the ceremony that is reflecting you. Lord, uniting Brother Daniel and Sister Caitlin as one. Father, as we go back at the beginning, we heard our pastor here mentioning, Lord, how, oh, when you created, Lord, everything, you looked at Adam who reflected your own image, who reflected your likeness. Lord, your holy sight, seeing him alone, your holiness declared, I will make him, I will give him a promise. Lord, that's the greatest, that the day that heaven and earth heard for the very first time, the very first promise uttering out of the mouth of the great Jehovah. And Lord, we are standing this afternoon seeing, Lord, this promise you made that I will make your help meet. You have made it. You have fulfilled it for the couple before us, for Brother Daniel and Sister Caitlin. And Father, we just want to ask you, as you gave yourself to Adam and Eve for their protection by the way of your sovereign word, Father, you be the protection again for Brother Daniel and Sister Caitlin. The same word. Bind them, Lord. Let the wings of your health be upon them. Father, if we even go back in our natural memories, there was nothing that could take Daniel or Caitlin out before this day. No sickness, no power of, of any bullet, no accident, no fire, nothing could do it because this day was ordained of you to come. Father, we just asking, Lord, graciously to you that you will cover them. You will be their strength, Lord. You will be their health. Bind their hearts together that they will be the very reflection of your revelation of this hour. You, Christ, uniting again with your bride. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. For as much you, Daniel, and Caitlin have consented together in holy wedlock, and have witnessed the same before God and this congregation, and in so doing have given and pledged your vows to each other, and have declared the same by the giving and receiving of rings, I, by the authority that is vested in me as a minister of the word of God, 
pronounce you husband and wife in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What God has joined, let no man put asunder. Daniel, you may now kiss your bride. Amen. Now you can turn and face the congregation. It's a great honor and a privilege for me to present to you for the first time, Mr. and Mrs. Daniel Arendt. Amen. There's a table dressed in linen. Oh, the banquet is prepared. A host of angels gather for the celebration there. The bride is almost ready in spotless white array. A hush falls over heaven as the groom begins to say. in my love secrets in that book you know so well just look a little closer you'll find victory over hell and though it's Satan's Eden and the world's in disarray the oil for you this day come away my love come away my love I have waited for this day when I can give you awaits us come away my love please uh, remain seated the ushers will come in to dismiss you by rows also we'd like to make sure everybody knows that they're invited to the uh, reception that will be at Ebenezer Mennonite Church you can find the address on the back side of the program so you can find your way there also, they're asking if you please make your way as quickly as possible to the venue so that you can begin partaking of the refreshments when you get there. God bless you and thank you for being here today.